Each week, the Bible as Literature podcast brings you in-depth discussion of the biblical text in a format short enough for your morning commute, but long enough to be substantive, posing difficult questions meant to keep you engaged. If you value this work, please consider donating as little as 25 cents per episode. That's just $1 per month. To learn more, please visit patreon.com forward slash Bible. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash Bible. Thank you. Hi, this is Father Mark Bulos with the Bible as Literature podcast. The ability to read biblical signs which comes from hearing, reciting, and doing the commandments of Scripture protects us from being fooled by false prophets. Is something a righteous act? What's the difference between an exorcism performed by Jesus and one conducted by a son of the Pharisees? In the Gospel of Matthew, the answer to this question is twofold. First, do you recognize the commandment of God at work in the action? And two, what outcome did the action produce? You will know a tree by its fruit. Richard and I discuss the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 12, verses 43 to 45. You're listening to the Bible as literature. Hi, this is Father Mark Bulos. And this is Dr. Richard Benton. And you are listening to episode 298 of the Bible as Literature podcast. This week, Richard and I caught up to talk about last week's episode and how nuanced the discussion of signs and of fruit and of the light of God's instruction in Matthew, how nuanced these literary symbols are. And as we were talking, one metaphor came to the forefront, and that is the example of the Jewish custom of shouting mitzvah when you see an action that seems to reflect the teaching, the commandment, literally. When you say mitzvah, you're shouting commandment. So you see something in the world, for example, someone providing care for a vulnerable person, someone giving charity to someone in need, someone showing compassion on someone who has experienced some kind of loss or tragedy. When someone in the Jewish tradition sees something that reflects the righteousness of the Torah, their impulse is to shout commandment, mitzvah, as if to say, look, there's the commandment at work in the world. It's very powerful. This custom reflects the teaching of Matthew. Matthew is saying that the commandment, the word itself, is the sign. However, when that commandment is the light that illumines the lamp of your eye, when you see someone doing something that reflects that commandment, that action becomes a sign because it's conflated with the commandment that produced it. It's very much connected to this idea in the Pauline school that when one of us does something correct, even though people can see us doing the correct thing, what they're really seeing is the commandment at work in us. And in Matthew, we know that the praise goes not even to Jesus, but to the Father for the commandment at work in the actor. But what we see is the actor. And so suddenly, that righteous action, which is credited to the Father, becomes a sign of the kingdom of the heavens. This idea of the mitzvah, I think, is important. When a Jew sees someone acting according to the commandment, they would call it a mitzvah because they fulfilled the commandment. But the commandment and the good work itself are both called mitzvah. And that's what's interesting about Hebrew. The commandment and the carrying it out are the same. As we talk about Torah as a seed, which of course we talked about all the time when we talked about Mark, Torah is a seed. And how do you know where it's been planted? When there's fruit that comes. Those fruits are the actions that come from the seed of Torah itself. Now, when it comes to the scribes and the Pharisees, they know Torah. I mean, they're scribes. I mean, they read it all the time. And 
they're spreading Torah all the time. Does that necessarily mean that Torah is planted in their own soil? We don't know. We have to look at their actions. If they are fulfilling the commandments, then yes. If they're not fulfilling the commandments, then no. But it's not exclusive to them. If their listeners are fulfilling the commandments, then we know that they taught Torah. But whether they are acting according to Torah does not determine whether they were spreading Torah or not. And as you and I talk, Father, all the time, the sower is not super important. The teacher is important insofar as they pass on this knowledge, but the person of the teacher doesn't matter. And I think the best example of this is when we talked about last week, which is Jonah. Jonah was not faithful to God. Jonah was not faithful to Torah. I mean, he was forced physically by being swallowed by a whale and moved physically back to where he started from. Okay, this is not faithfulness. This is forcing him. If there were guns to put against Jonah's head, he would have needed one. Okay, he did not want to do it. Nevertheless, he spoke the word that God told him to speak, even under duress, and it worked. How do we know it worked? Because all of Nineveh repented. Jonah spread the word. How do we know he spread the word? Because the Ninevites repented. Not because Jonah became a great guy. The book ended him as a terrible guy. We know that Jonah's not good. We don't even have a suspicion that Jonah even followed the word that he was bringing to the Ninevites. But we do know that he had the word. We do know that he had the Torah because the Ninevites changed. The Ninevites repented. And that's all that John the Baptist was asking for in the beginning of Matthew, is fruits worthy of repentance. The Ninevites had it. So we know that Torah was among the Ninevites. And we know that Jonah, at least passively, had a sack of Torah. <laughs> he wasn't necessarily doing anything except throwing it around, but it wasn't taking root in his own soil. That we know because he was rotten. Okay, He wasn't fulfilling the commandment. But the Ninevites did. So Torah must be present if the Ninevites are acting according to the commandment. As in the case of the Gospel of Mark, the question in Matthew 12 relates to the question at the beginning of Deuteronomy chapter 13. And this is so relevant to the New Testament, it bears repeating. If a prophet or a dreamer of dreams arises among you and gives you a sign or a wonder— and the sign or the wonder comes true concerning which he spoke to you, saying, Let us go after other gods whom you have not known, and let us serve them. You shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God is testing you to find out if you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. In other words, in the way that this is made functional here in Matthew, if you are asking and seeking and knocking the teaching of Scripture, then you will have demonstrated that you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. And then the light of his instruction will illumine the lamp of your eye so that when someone comes to try to fool you, say, for example, a Pharisee, you can't be fooled. And the message also goes to the Pharisee who is misjudging Jesus in chapter 12. The reason you are misjudging me is because even if you're teaching Torah verbatim to your disciples, you yourself are not submitting to it. And therefore, you yourself cannot discern correctly. And therefore, you yourself are vulnerable to the false prophet, if not the actual false prophet among my people. So it's critical. It's about discernment, Rich. No one can judge before the time. However, Scripture is given so that you can read the signs and navigate life and not get into a kind of trouble you can't get out of. Yeah, the trouble that the Pharisees get themselves into is exactly what you said. They don't have the ability to discern. They think they do, and they try to discern. But Jesus continually undermines how they don't understand. They are trying to use their worldly sense of tribe 
to discern whether Jesus is correct or not, whether Jesus is in league with demons or not. But they're using their worldly sense of tribe. And Jesus says, you can't use that because I cast out demons, your sons cast out demons. Is that a good work or is that a bad work? And he shows them that they're contradicting themselves. But then when he talks about Jonah and the Queen of Sheba, really it's the word that matters because it's the word that allows you to discern. And then ultimately in this upcoming passage, he's saying just because you exercise a demon doesn't necessarily mean that something good is going to happen. It only matters what is left after the demon goes and what you see after the demon goes. If that is going the right direction, then you know that Torah is there. It means that the strong man has been bound and defeated. But if you just leave it empty, then all kinds of bad things are going to happen and you're going to see soon enough. So it's not enough to exercise. The exorcism is not the matter. The matter is what is put in there to keep the demons out. What is the spirit that fills that vessel, that person, so that an evil spirit can't come back and take over with all his buddies? It's making sure that there is a word in there, the word of Torah, so that person is completely possessed by Torah and is only acting in that way. So it's not enough to use your worldly sense to try and figure out what's happening. You have to be filled with that Torah if you're going to discern anything and if you have any hope of acting according to the mitzvah, according to the commandment. So here in verse 43 and 44, which I'm about to read, we are going to see exactly the test. It's the test in Deuteronomy. We're going to look to see whether or not the Pharisees were truly teaching their disciples to love the Lord their God by loving his instruction or whether they were filling them with an empty word, which produces a different result. And in a way, we said this offline, Richard, this triptych, verses 43, 44, and 45, are a kind of eschatological metaphor, because ultimately we won't know whether or not they were truly sowing the correct seed until the judgment in Matthew 25. Now, when the unclean spirit goes out of a man, it passes through waterless places seeking rest and does not find it. Here, I think it's important to clarify that the waterless place, it's a literal translation, is a place where it can't find any life for itself. It brings to mind this image of a desert place, a lonely place, where there's no oasis, where you can't settle down and find life. There are so many cool places where the Bible uses this metaphor, where you're out in the dry land, where you long after God, like the deer longs after waters. It's about being in the wilderness. And the beautiful metaphor of the Exodus itself, where God provides the water for the people in the wilderness. God provides the food for the people in the wilderness. The big punishment in Exodus and Numbers is to be cast out. And if you're cast out, then you're left on your own to fend for yourself, which is not possible in a society like this. You're completely vulnerable. You have no place to sleep. You have no way to drink. You have no way to eat. The metaphor we would use from our point of view would be that you've got the demon against the ropes. He's got no hope. He's been beat up. He's about ready to fall. He's been defeated. And there's no hope left for him. Then it says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds it unoccupied, swept, and put in order. Here in verse 44, this translation, my house is correct. Iston ikonmu. It's the unclean spirit referring to its former victim as its own property. And, of course, the only one who holds property in the biblical story is the father of Jesus. So in the language of the example, you are seeing the blasphemy of the false teaching, and it comes to a disciple who's unoccupied which is the failure of the test in the judgment. 
why would a disciple of the Pharisee in Matthew chapter 12 be unoccupied? He should have filled that space with God's instruction, and he failed his student. And it's interesting in this metaphor, Richard, that it says not only unoccupied, but swept and put in order. We're doing everything we're supposed to. We're following all the rules. But somehow, because my vanity wasn't consumed by the substance of the instruction, that neatly ordered room is in a way irrelevant because it's vanos. It can't produce anything. And now when the test comes, this individual, this disciple who was once possessed, is going to fall prey to the same kind of suffering, but on a larger scale. His house. I mean, this unclean spirit really made a home of this person. He made himself at home. So the demon wants to go back to his house. And I, again, and Father, it's great that you bring this up because he finds it all tidied up. Everything is clean and ready to go. Okay, but there's nobody there. It fits nicely with the metaphor that Jesus used earlier in the chapter. If you're going to take over the house, you got to beat the strong man. Well, the strong man's gone. There's no strong man there. So you can just walk in there. No problem. There's no one to defeat. Like you said, Father, you got to fill it with Torah. You got to bring in a whole host of good spirits i.e. the spirits of Torah, so that they occupy it. And if you bring in the strong man of Torah to occupy the house, the demon can't just move in. You need to make sure that the spirit of Torah has made its home in the heart if there's any hope of keeping the demons out. Remember, when I say heart, I'm talking about the mind. I'm not talking about the seed of your emotions. I'm saying your will and your thinking have to be completely occupied by Torah to keep the demons out. And this is an old saying. I mean, idle hands is a devil's playground, right? Idle hands means you're doing nothing. It means it's empty. You're tidy and neat and ready to go, which means what? You're making a great home for a demon. I can just see the unclean spirit coming to the house and taking a look and looking back to his friends and saying, hey guys, there's no mitzvah here. It's all clear. Come on in. <laughs> I mean, that's exactly what's happening. So this is, in a way, how you test the validity of the exorcism. You can discern whether it's a sign of the kingdom, meaning that it reflects the commandment, by whether or not you see the commandment there. The absence of the commandment exposes the vanity of the wonder that was done by the false prophet. It does not reflect the love of the Lord your God. It reflects the love of some other God, some other teaching. Then it goes and takes along with it seven other spirits more wicked than itself, and they go in and live there. And the last state of that man becomes worse than the first. That is the way it will also be with this evil generation. Now, that phrase, the last state of that man becomes worse than the first, is called upon later in the Gospel of Matthew with respect to the resurrection. And the point that Matthew is making is that if the teaching doesn't fill the emptiness, maybe the empty tomb, if instead you're looking for an idol in the tomb, then the situation after the resurrection is going to be even worse for you. And remember, they're preoccupied with, is the body there? Did they steal the body? All this nonsense. Because what we should be looking for is the mitzvah. If you're looking for the mitzvah, you're going to see the correct biblical sign. If you're looking for the body from a worldly perspective, you're going to find a situation, as Matthew himself says, that is much worse than the first fraud. That's a great way of putting it, Father. I mean, the empty tomb was attempted to, at least, to be filled with a false word that the disciples came and stole the body in the night. That leads to a certain type of action. But understanding that it was the power of God that raised him allows for a different action based on a different teaching. So this is how it differs. And what's so 
wonderful about how this ending matches with the beginning of this whole scene when Jesus cast out the demon in the beginning is that the scribes and the Pharisees were trying to tell, is this a good exorcism? Is this a bad exorcism? Well, we know we don't like Jesus, so it must be a bad exorcism. And Jesus says, well, what about when your students do exorcisms? Is that a good one or a bad one? And ultimately, Jesus says, doesn't matter. You can have an exorcism, whoever causes it to happen. But the true test is what state is that person in afterwards? Is that person from whom the evil spirit was exercised filled with Torah or empty and ready for the evil spirit and all of his buddies to come and have a party? The preparation and what is placed in that empty house is actually what matters. It makes me believe that whether it's an evil person or a good person who exercises this evil spirit, as long as somebody puts Torah in there, functionally it's good because now the person is following Torah, whatever led to that point. If the person is following Torah in the end, the only fact that remains is that he followed a mitzvah. And, you know, as always, Richard, it's difficult for me to hear these critical teachings from the gospel stories without thinking about the teaching of Paul. And that's, of course, how we were formatted growing up in the Eastern Church. You hear the epistle, and then you hear the gospel. And I don't think that rubric is a coincidence. I think that the liturgicist understood something about the way the New Testament works. And I can't escape Paul's admonition in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 that he wouldn't even judge himself. So you can discern, I think this is important, and I appreciate your point, you can discern on the basis of the light of Scripture whether or not something looks false to you, because Scripture is your guiding principle. However, only God can judge, and not even Jesus, let alone Paul, will judge before the time. And so I absolutely agree that ultimately we can't know with certainty, we can't judge with certainty truly who is the ambassador of the kingdom until the Lord comes in power. Thanks very much, Dr. Benton. Thank you, Father. You've just heard the Bible as literature. Thanks for listening. The Bible as Literature is a production of the Ephesus School Network.